dharana or concentration is good to bring the mind back to one object from its tendency to run about object to object many times in a second. So it can be good to bring it by concentration back to one object. This is just like holding the tail of a dog. As long as you hold it, it is straight. When you leave it, it becomes curly again. It is not the nature of the tail to be straight. Meditation means there is no object or subject in the mind. All the rest is concentration of some sort. Concentration has to be practiced. In the practice, the mind will never be destroyed. It may be calm for some time, so long as you are practicing, but it will not destroy itself. It will not be destroyed. So the question is whether to keep the mind calm by practice or destroy it forever. The latter is absolutely necessary for freedom. When there is no mind, there is freedom. Concentration is practiced the world over, but I don't find any results from it. Concentrating on an object, like the breath or body, is done with some effort. Effort is needed between the observer and the object of observation. When there is effortlessness, when the mind does not function and returns to a natural state of calm, peace, this is freedom. So, how to do it? There are different ways. Actually, to have freedom, 
doesn't require any effort or method. You don't tread down the beaten track. You have to find your true nature, who you are. Before trying to know anything else or follow any method, even those prescribed to you by the ancient saints, leave aside everything. Sit quietly and do not move your mind or intellect. Then, observe the observer. This is your true nature, from where everything else comes. It is your own nature. Don't forget. If you make any effort or use any method of trying to achieve something at some distant future, this will bring you into time. And time is mind. So this will be the play of mind only. But your original nature is empty. If you follow any thought that arises in your mind, you will find it arises from emptiness, from its source. And when you are aware when you see, I am that source itself, then there is no need to practice anything, no need to go anywhere, and you will see that you have always been that. This is called freedom and you are not to achieve or attain it in some distant future. 
it is already here. There is a fear of facing emptiness because you are living in so many concepts and things. When you meet the emptiness face to face, you lose everything. All the concepts of past, present and future which you considered real. This is my life. Are you holding on? This is your supposed strength. This is a feeling that you are living along with your concepts. When they leave you, you have fear. Fear of dying in the ocean of nectar. Fear of death in the nectar. What is the meaning of nectar? Eternity deathlessness. We cling to something for safety and we find we are holding on to the body, the mind, the senses for safety. We don't realize that by getting rid of these things, we have true peace. When we go from waking state to sleep, we lose everything that we held in the waking state. Relationships and possessions are lost to us in sleep. We have to let them go. We have no fear as we drop into sleep. We enjoy it. We welcome it. But we are afraid of this waking dropping into emptiness because we haven't had the experience. Meditation practices and techniques like Vipassana set up looking at objects 
and just reinforce the mind and by the mind it is just more mind like holding on to the tail of the dog but it does have a value it allows you to raise this question and that is enough value for it unless you hold the tail out straight how will you know that it will return to crookedness and that is the lesson from all the practices that are done all the sastras and the scriptures say this is the teaching reject us even the descriptions reject me this is the benefit you have been given otherwise you will not give up your concepts if you practice you will only become fatigued when you are fatigued you throw away everything at that instant you are free to get rid of everything is freedom everything that you do suggests get rid of me to get rid of desires is freedom freedom from the function of the mind the function of the mind is desire so get rid of the desire get rid of the desire for samsara get rid of the desire to enjoy other worlds like heavens get rid of that get rid of the creator of heaven and samsara get rid of him also after that get rid of this renunciation reject all of these then renounce this renunciation itself then this is freedom everything you do is only to get rid of desire even the body will be happy when you get rid of it all that you are doing is returning home which is a very safe place and where there is no mind there is no form everything every time even every breath wants to find and have peace even each inhalation 
needs rest for a moment. Before the exhale, it takes a rest in between. Nobody wants to work. Not even the breath wants to work. The breath enters emptiness for some time before entering again into functioning. We must touch emptiness, whatever we do. We can't do without this empty moment. But we ignore this moment because it is so readily available. You are not to do anything. It happens between thought and thought also. When the mind takes a rest. Two thoughts cannot happen at the same time. Think, stop, next thought. Always you are surrounded by that which you seek outside. You are inside that thing and outside also. It is the same thing, only we have to pay a little attention. following any tradition, I don't think the essence can be arrived at. I don't think anyone living in the traditional way has been freed from samsara. Take the case of the Buddha. He rejected all the traditions. He tried all the traditions. He found they did not bring him the thing that he wanted. He tried, but then he said he could not arrive at the essence, at enlightenment. He sat under the tree and found the essence by himself. Abandon all traditional dharmas and you will arrive at the true dharma.
with traditional practices such as insight meditation. The observer has to observe something, such as the breath. What you observe is through the mind. So whatever is gained through the observation is only mental. Who is the observer? The observer is not tackled. Only the observed, the object of the senses. Remove the wall of outside and inside. For example, Nirvana is seen as inside and samsara is outside. Or form is inside and emptiness outside. If you are looking for emptiness, you are somewhere outside of it. So you construct a wall between you and something unknown. If you remove this wall, you don't need any meditation. To whom does the body belong? To whom do the feelings belong? To whom do the thoughts belong? To whom do the objects belong? The body has no capacity to be enlightened because it is nothing but earth, air, water, fire. To arrive at freedom, we reject the body. We also reject the feelings, thoughts and objects. What happens if we reject all this? Who is capable of rejecting all these things? One is neither body, feelings, thoughts, nor objects. All this is due to self. You can reject everything, but can you reject I? We all accept that we are in the waking state with the body, feelings, thoughts, objects. Let us move towards the sleep state. 
in the last second before sleep, what do you do? Do you see all these things? What do you do to reject all these things and enter into sleep? Unless one abandons everything, one cannot sleep. How does one enter into sleep? You have to reject all these things. Even your partner who is next to you in bed. You love them, but still, you reject them and let go. Why do you reject all these beautiful things of life and all this samsara? Are you not more happy in deep sleep than in the daytime? So the entering into sleep is a simultaneous rejection of the waking state. Then you enter this sleeping state that you do not know. What is there during the sleep? Who is awake? Are you happy or unhappy in deep sleep? You are very content. In the supermarket, we purchase many things. Is contentment going to yet another marketplace? or returning home. The market is the body, feelings, thoughts and objects. If all these things could give us real contentment, we would never like to go to sleep. There is something more precious, and that is why we prefer to sleep. So in sleep, we do not experience all those things that we speak about. Who was awake during sleep? You say, nobody that I know. But something was awake. Because the next morning you say, during my sleep, I did not think about anything. I was very happy. So during the sleep, who experiences this happiness? Let us start from here. This waking state is samsara. Let us end body, feelings, thoughts, objects here. This ends, but deep sleep has not yet started. Beyond is unknown. 
beyond is emptiness. What is known is rejected, but beyond is not seen. Between that beyond, let us not give it a name, and things of waking condition. What do you see in this moment? This I identification and everything that goes with it comes to an end. But something beyond has not yet started. It cannot go back now. In this moment, it is between the known and the unknown. When this I is facing something else, this I will feel shy, like a new bride. You will be happy to be brought to this point, which is not easy to speak about with language. What is in front now is what I has never experienced in body, feelings, and so on. I is fatigued with all these things, and this I will simply disappear. It will embrace something else, which has no name. It is a jump into nectar, with no subject and no object. If you give up all practices, what will happen? If you have unloaded all the dharmas, you are absolutely naked. When you are naked, you will jump into the ocean, never to return. There is fear, and that person who is not willing must be pushed. Some people need a push. You need a push to somewhere else where you are hesitating. But then one starts a tradition of pushing. You then need a son of God and a religion is started. Truly speaking, you don't need a push. You are never at the end, and you never start from anywhere else.
going to the end, to the edge, is a concept. It is only a concept of mind to think one has started from somewhere else and is going to arrive. And at that point, you need a push. You have never started or ended anything. And you have never needed any push. There is no samsara and no nirvana. The construction of mind is a complete fiction. That is why it is called mind. There is a suggestion of mind. I want to be free from samsara. Then the practice starts. The method starts and the dharmas start. To proceed towards nirvana from samsara is also a concept. Nirvana is a concept. Another trap like samsara. But when we call it a trap, this is also a trap. We then want to get out of this trap. We know by a special spontaneous knowledge. Then you do not need any push. You do not jump anywhere, for there is nowhere to go and nowhere to come from. For there is nothing to be rejected and nothing to be accepted. You are free to accept everything and reject everything. Sitting, standing, running. It doesn't make any difference. This is nothing to do with meditation. People who are crippled sit all the time. They are not meditating. And someone who is meditating whose mind is running towards sense objects is not meditating. The fishing cranes are silent 
and concentrated and standing on one leg. What suddener? But they are finding fish. So it depends on the mind. And the mind will trouble you even while sitting, standing, sleeping. It will trouble you. You will worry the cobra might be coming that a tiger is coming. It will give you fear. Mind is trouble. Day and night, it is never at rest. Even at night, it is mostly dreaming. Very few minutes of real rest. Even samadhi of yoga or practice is only another state. One day a yogi went to the king. He told the king that he could go into samadhi for 40 days. For 40 days he would not eat, sleep or even breathe. The king said, if you can do this, I will give you a horse. This was what the yogi wanted, so he went into samadhi. After 40 days, he did not come out. Years went by and the yogi stayed in deep samadhi. The king eventually died. The horse died. Still the yogi stayed in samadhi. The king's son was now on the throne, years later, and the yogi opened his eyes. He looked around and said, I want my horse. This is only mind. Once an 80-year-old Swami came to visit me 
when I was 60. He said, I am a yogi. I have lived 40 days underground in Samadhi. I only have two days here, so please don't speak about yoga. I have studied all the scriptures and the Gita, so please don't discourse on these things. I told him, yes of course, I will speak about something you have not mentioned. But how about those things you were still carrying, which you have brought with you here into my room? Will you please go out of my room and leave all these things outside and then come to me and I will speak to you, not touching this garbage which you are carrying all these years. He didn't understand. I said, I'll help you Swamiji. You bring all this garbage which you have spoken of and I will help you carry it and leave it outside. Then you return empty to me and I will speak about something else. I sent him out. He stood at the door for about five minutes. Then he came in and was about to touch my feet. I stopped him halfway. No, Swamiji, I said. That is not possible on three counts. First, I am a householder and you are a monk. Therefore, I have to touch your feet. Second, you are learned and I don't know how to read Sanskrit. And third, you were 20 years older than I. He said, this teaching no one has taught me. There were none to teach this. I am very happy. You have enlightened me now. Tomorrow I am not going on any more pilgrimages. I am finished with all that. I have about 150 students. They can go. But tomorrow, what time can I come to see you? I laughed. You still want to come? A few days later, one of his students asked me, What did you do to the Swami? He has rejected everything. Nobody teaches this emptiness. Everyone wants to run an ashram or commune. When you speak of emptiness, there is no more to learn. Emptiness is emptiness. San Francisco or Delhi. Wherever you go, the emptiness surrounds you. Silence will follow you wherever you are.
whatever practice you are doing, continue until it leaves you. Or, if you choose to stop it, do so with respect. It got you this far and must be treated with respect. The silence of which I speak cannot be affected by daily life. Life must continue in an ordinary way. Dharma means the way. It has to do with concepts. The root is that which you hold. Ways are different, different dharmas, different concepts. The highest dharma is to reject all dharmas. If you reject all concepts, all your ways, this is the Dharma that will force you back to source. Otherwise, ways will take you from source to outside. When you reject all dharmas, this dharma will lead you home. Therefore, the best is the supreme dharma, to reject all dharma.